bulletin uh, and an outline like this. Uh, please raise your hands uh, and uh, it will be supplied you. Uh, please make sure that you have one because you need to fill out uh, some very important blanks. Now, last Sunday, we began a new series on the subject, Don't Be Negligent. And uh, that's something that we use almost every day, right? Don't neglect your job. Don't neglect your health. We look at the young people and say, don't neglect your studies. And uh, so, uh, all the while, uh, this word neglect uh, plays a very important part in your life and my life. And last Sunday, we looked at the subject, don't <laughs> neglect your salvation. We looked at one verse in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, if you haven't listened to that message... I call it a foundational message. I would really encourage you to go to our website and it's all there for you to watch, uh, listen. The notes are also there and uh, uh, to, to go through it uh, at a very personal level. Now, today we are going to look at another very important subject. We are going to build on that foundation. Don't neglect the house of God. And there are two scriptures that we are going to use, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Now, it's very interesting, this Old Testament verse, many of you may not have even seen it before. It comes at the end of a chapter with a lot of names. And I don't know about you, there was a time when I came across a chapter with names, I kind of bypassed it, I just ignored it. Why bother with all these names? But uh, we miss a lot when we... Uh, do that. And so chapter 10 and the last line of that uh, chapter says this. It's in your notes. We will not neglect the house of our God. That should become a motto for all of us. Parents, it should be your motto for your children. We will not neglect the house of God. Now, what's the New Testament counterpart to that scripture, the one that you know very well? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us, please circle the word us, because the Christian faith was never meant to be lived in isolation. <laughs> you can't make it on your own. I can't make it on my own. That's why God has placed us in a body. We are a corporate body. Let us. Us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. Now, here is our word not neglecting to meet together. You know, from my childhood, my parents faithfully took me to church. And I've told you this before I went to church four times on a Sunday. I don't think any one of you here went to church four times on a Sunday. I grew up with that. And there came a time in my life when it was inconceivable for me to think of staying at home without being in the house of God. Once I had a raging temperature of 104 degrees, I still went to the house of God. Now you might say foolish and you're right. But I just couldn't think of staying at home without being in the house of God and the people of God. And that was a time when I didn't even really know the Lord at a personal level. But I really thank my parents, both by example and by teaching, they took us to the house of God. And so to continue reading, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. So even 2,000 years ago, there were people who made it a habit not to go to church. They'll be found everywhere else, but not in the house of God. And it's nothing new today, folks, right? But encouraging one another. So why do we come to church? One of the reasons is so that we can offer mutual encouragement to each other. And all the more, why should we come to church? Why? Because the second coming of the Lord draws near. The word day there is in capital day, uh, D. 
because you see the day drawing near. I would love to be in the house of God when the Lord Jesus Christ returns the second time to take us home to himself. I would not want to be seen in a movie house when he returns. That would be pretty embarrassing. Right? Okay, good. So, we are going to go back to this Nehemiah passage because I want to set it in context. So now you need to start filling your blanks. So you know that the people of Israel, on account of their idolatry, they were exiled to Babylon. And then in God's great mercy, after 70 years of exile, when God purged them and cleansed them of idolatry, Cyrus, the Persian king, came on the scene and he was very benevolent. And he told the Jewish people, you can return back to your land. Now, they didn't return all at once. If you look at history, they returned back to Israel in what I would like to call three waves. So they went in the first wave, second wave, and there was a third wave. And they went back, and one of the first things they did was they rebuilt the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. They rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah went later to rebuild the walls. Those were the two dominant features of Israelite life, the temple and the walls. Now, what happened? So let's fill the blanks. The first bullet, return and rebuilding of the temple from exile in Babylon. So write those two words down. The return of the people and the rebuilding of the temple. Very exciting if you happen to be a Jew. To be able to come back home, right? Settle down in your ancestral property and to be able to rebuild the temple. But then, as always happens, excitement wears off, dull routine takes over and then neglect comes into play. And suddenly they recognize, so your second word, recognition that the house of God had been neglected. It's one thing to put up the material structure. But it's another thing to get involved in the spiritual life of the house of God. So the temple as a building was in place, but the spiritual life was nowhere near what God wanted it to be. And the people realized we are missing out on the spiritual component of the house of God. Now, how did that recognition come? It just didn't come automatically. And this is what excites me as a pastor and preacher, your third word, your third uh, blank, the reading of the law. The people only had the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, and Ezra, the, the man that God used to bring about national revival. You know what he did? He set apart an entire day, whole day, where the people congregated, and he would just get up with the help of others and they just read through the first five books of the Old Testament. Just imagine doing that here at New Life. I know of churches that have done that, where they have read through the whole Bible over a month's period. Very exciting. And then, of course, there were interpreters. As passages were read, explanations were given. Revival will never happen if the word of God is not opened and read. If you are not reading your Bible, you won't experience revival. Take, take the dust off the Bible and start reading. And when you start reading and when you start thinking, things are going to happen. Things are going to change. Reading of the law. The fourth uh, blank, it has to lead to repentance. So in Nehemiah chapter 9, you have one of the most powerful prayers of repentance anywhere recorded in the Bible. And I would really encourage you to take some time and read through Nehemiah chapter 9. And it's very interesting, uh, Nehemiah uses the word not in the singular, uh, singular but in the plural. He didn't say 
I have sinned, he said, we have sinned. And even though Nehemiah was a good man, he identified with the sin of the people and led the people in national repentance. Now, it didn't stop there. And uh, this is where chapter 10 of Nehemiah comes into play. The people make a resolution, just like how maybe some of you made a New Year resolution. I'm not going to eat chocolates. And the next day, you ate a whole box of chocolates. Right? That's my story. The people made a resolution. The resolution was about what? To be faithful to the house of God. I'm going to be faithful. When the doors of the church open, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be involved in all the activities of the church. I'm going to be a part and parcel of the life of the church. That was what the resolution was all about. If you like another word, the word would be covenant. If you like another word, the word would be commitment, the one that we love to use. A resolution was made. It was put down in writing. And in chapter 10 of Nehemiah, nine times the house of God is mentioned. Nine times in one chapter. And if you go through all those names, which normally you and I would love to skip, you will come across 84 names. And those 84 names, for the most part, were not individual names. They were the heads of clans. Meaning, I as the father took responsibility for my family and I put the signature. Meaning that God was going to hold me accountable for my family being faithful to the house of God. So that's why parents, are you listening very carefully? If you want your children to get excited about the church, you have to be excited about the church. <laughs> if you're not excited about the church, how do you expect your children to get excited about the church? Right? So I bless the memory of my parents. They were both excited about the church. They modeled it. They took us. And now all the children, the four of us, siblings, we are sold over the church. Thanks to our parents. So if I were to pass a covenant form this morning, wonder how many of us would have the courage to sign it. Just on one point, I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. And this morning I want to compliment all of you for having come. Uh, as I did my walk and as I prayed, I said, God, I don't know who is going to show up. Should I change the message today? And uh, the Spirit of God rebuked me and said, uh, I'm in charge, not you. Aren't you happy about that? God is in charge and you're here and I'm very excited about that. So now, now all that is introduction. Aren't you happy about a lengthy introduction like that? Because the sermon could go till two because lunch is being provided. Now relax. Uh, point A. Point A, the purposes. Why should I go to church? Listen very carefully because this is one of the key questions that is asked in today's society and culture. Why go to church? Later on, you can take these 10 reasons and put it on your fridge door. Right? When your children are lazy, you just take the sheet and start reading it out loud to them. And let the Spirit of God bring the conviction. Why go to church? Why bother with the church? Ten reasons, all beginning with the letter P. Okay, here we go. Later you can write this in your Bible, and I will be checking your Bibles for it. Number one, because of the presence of God. In a way that you and I cannot conceive, God very actively is going to manifest his presence in and through the house of God. Now, people very glibly say, God is present everywhere, I can worship. Those people never worship. I can guarantee that. Because unless you come to a place with fellow believers where you focus and engage in meaningful worship, you're not going to do it outside. The world takes over. Netflix takes over. Right? Most families now have Netflix. Right? So when I go visiting, that's the first question I ask. Do you have Netflix? Right? 
And they very eagerly take the, this thing and show me the whole lot. Right? So how do you compete with that? Now I'm going to read for you from Genesis chapter 28. would encourage you to turn if you uh, uh, want to look at the development of this thought. So Genesis 28 is uh, our good friend Jacob. And uh, he has deceived his brother <laughs> Esau and he's on the run. And he's in open countryside. And in the night time, in the field, he's going to sleep. So he takes a stone for his pillow. Aren't you happy you have a lovely soft pillow to sleep on at night? And also, I think this is a very appropriate time uh, to say thank you to Brother Samson because Brother Samson is spoiling us. God has gifted him with the ability to make cushions, Babuji. So he has taken that skill and he has experimented with making cushions for the church. So two sets of cushions have already been provided and we want to thank our brother Samson for that. Now I know there are some people for physical reasons would need those cushions. <laughs> but now the thought is to make it available more largely. Recipe for disaster, my opinion. Because now you have a cushion on which to sit and sleep. Anyway, we'll discuss that, but thank you, Brother Samson, right? Just like Joy and Vera are using their energies on food, you're using all your energies on making cushions. By the way, I gave you sizes for cushions that I need, right? Thank you. Okay, so Genesis 28 and uh, reading verses 16 and 17. Okay, you, you might want to follow it in your Bible, 16 and 17. Early the next morning, Jacob, uh, uh, 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he had a dream. Surely the Lord is in this place and I am not aware of it. How awesome is this place? Now watch the wording. This is none other than the house of God. And there you have the first concept of the house of God. Out in the open countryside, a man on a run from his brother has an encounter with God and he is filled with dread and fear and he calls the place Bethel the house of God. Every time you come to a physical structure called the church, you and I should leave with the sense that we have encountered the presence of the living God, Lord God Almighty. Why go to church? Because in a way that cannot be explained, we encounter the manifest presence of God. And you know what? We carry that presence with us when we go back home and when we face the work week or when we go to school and university. The presence of God. Number two, the passage that Clifford read for us, Isaiah chapter 6. So again, setting the context, Isaiah belonged to an aristocrat family and he was in close touch with the king who had ruled for 55 years and all of a sudden the king dies and as a judgment from God and uh, Isaiah's whole world is blown apart. <laughs> and in his deep sorrow, Isaiah went to a bar and drank. Just checking you out. No, that's what many people in Canada would do. Isaiah went to the house of God. And there he had a vision of God. And the moment he had the vision of God, he was struck with a sense of his own sinfulness and wretchedness. Beloved, every time we come to the house of God, again in a way that uh, we cannot explain, God convicts us and exposes us of our sin, our hypocrisy, and of our self-righteousness. Uh, I was reading a devotional. The best way to know that a person is egocentric is listen to a conversation. How many times they use the personal pronoun I? You know a marriage is in trouble when uh, I is used instead of we. 
that's getting very close home some of you are already sweating right so the second reason why we come to the house of god is for penitence and last morning we had a very beautiful demonstration of that as the people of god cried out to god and confessed their sin i had the joy of proclaiming forgiveness uh, of being washed in the blood as uh, god convicted us so the house of god is where we are convicted and cleansed thank god the cleansing also occurs right isaiah experienced it number 3 is purity purity so i i want to read isaiah 6 uh, just one verse isaiah chapter 6 and uh, isaiah has this vision and uh, look at what he says verse 5 woe is me the word woe means i am falling apart i am disintegrating have you ever felt disintegrating before the holiness of god everything is coming unglued falling to pieces in your life because you and i are being exposed that's what happened to isaiah woe is me i am disintegrating i am falling to pieces i am ruined I am done for. <laughs> If I were to use a German word, I am kaput. Finished. I picked it up from the movies. The word kaput. Okay. For I am a man of unclean lips. So can you see how specific Isaiah is? God, my problem is my mouth. God, I am using words I shouldn't use. And you know what? Isaiah was the best guy in town. If the best guy in town had to confess that he had a wild mouth, where does that place you and me? and i live among a people of unclean lips he didn't blame his society first like what people do today oh it's my parents oh it's no no i am responsible and yes the people around me also are making me to sin and uh, my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty that's what should happen to us in the house of god seeing the king the lord god almighty then god in his great mercy did something he provided cleansing for isaiah so a seraph uh, took a live coal from the altar and applied it to the organ that was causing sin in isaiah's life his mouth so we need to be bold folks we need to be able to look to the lord and say lord touch my heart wrong affections lord misplaced affections my passion for you is almost zero i'm very passionate about all the other stuff lay the live coal on my heart or it may be your mind my mind my mind is thinking all the rotten stuff unwanted stuff apply the coal to my mind or the lips or the hands or the feet whatever part is uh, causing the sin so there is purity there is purity in a very beautiful way we walk away from the house of god knowing that i am right with god right with my fellow man there is cleansing there is harmony there is healing that's why the devil doesn't want you to come to church because he wants to deprive you of all those blessings he wants you to be in the mud and the mire and to squirm in it right now number 4 number 4 why do we come to church for prayer for prayer purposes so the same book of isaiah i am going to read isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7 isaiah 56 and verse 7 it says there i will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy now watch the words in my house of prayer god calls the house that was built in his honor the house of prayer so what is new life new life christian church is the house of prayer and you remember on two occasions the lord jesus cleansed the temple of his day 
at the beginning of his ministry and at the termination of his ministry. So the people never really learned in the three years that the Lord was here on earth. Double cleansing of the temple. Why? Because the temple had failed to fulfill one of its primary functions of being a house of prayer. So why do I come to church? I come so that I can kneel, I can look into the face of my God and I can cry out to him. I can call upon his name. I want to receive his help. Can you pray at home? Yes, and you must pray at home. But there is something about coming to the house of God and praying. So Hannah, in a profound distress of barrenness, went to the house of God and prayed. And what an answer she received. And unfortunately, the priest of her day, totally backslidden spiritually, misunderstood her and thought that she was drunk. You know what? I would love to see people come during the week. We can make the doors open and kneel at the pews and pray. I think I told you the story uh, of uh, my hometown where I grew up back in Sri Lanka. Right in front of my house was a large Anglican church. And one priest turned that church the other way around. He came and said, we are not fulfilling our primary purpose. This should be a house of prayer. And you know what he did? He had the amazing courage to keep the doors of the church open 24-7-365. And that church became known all across the tiny little island as the church of the open door. Now, I was a little kid growing up. So, you know what I did? Uh, I got up at 2-3 in the morning and I peered through the window to see if any people are going to church. Never once was disappointed. There were cars, there were bicycles, there were three-wheelers. At the wee hours of the morning, people stopping and people going in and people praying. That was the only Anglican church uh, in my country that dared to have an all-night prayer meeting. And my parents packed us all up, the four kids, and took us for the prayer, all-night prayer meeting. That's why I am what I am today, folks. I am what I am today, not because of Bible college. I never went to any. It was the Bible college at home where my parents took us. And we uh, never forgot the lesson. Right? To this day we practice it. Presence of God, place of penitence, place of purity, place of prayer, and it's also the place of peace. So let me read. 1 Samuel chapter 1, the story of Hena, and look what happened. So Hena went, she poured out her heart to the Lord in prayer, and uh, the priest suddenly woke up and realized, my goodness, I have misjudged this woman. This is a godly woman crying out in her distress, and uh, let me read uh, verse 17, chapter 1 and verse 17. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. That is what I am called to do. When you come to the house of God, and when the first three steps are in place, then I have the joy of proclaiming peace over you, and to be able to say, May God grant you what you prayed for. And because of this singular incident, there came the mighty prophet for the nation, Samuel. All because of a mum, who was not a mum at that time, came to the church and prayed. So folks, we all have challenges, we all have distresses, we all have problems. Others can pray for you. But unless you personally come, humble yourself before the Lord and seek his face, and cry out to him, you know what? Nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. So, peace. I, I want to show you a beautiful cross-reference. You know, I got so excited preparing this lesson. My trouble was what to leave out. Uh, Psalm 29, verse 11. Uh, you've got to see this. Psalm 29, verse 11. Right? Mark it in your Bible. 
So, the last verse of Psalm 29. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Our God is not about division. Our God is not about destruction. Our God is the God who intends that you experience shalom in all its fullness. Well-being of the soul, the mind, the heart. <laughs> That's the divine peace. So number six, why go to church? Pleasure. You may say, Pastor, you got that one wrong. Right? We are supposed to be very solemn in church. Yes, there is a time for solemnity. But look at Psalm 42 and verse 4. Psalm 42 and verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. Pouring out your soul to God is a very therapeutic exercise that you must engage in. Don't bottle anything inside. Release it to the Lord and leave it with him. Release it and leave it with him. How I used to go with the multitude, so you don't go to church alone. Are you listening, church? You don't go to church alone. You go with the multitude. You're taking others with you. Right? I tell my youth, young people, when camp comes around, don't come alone. Bring a person on your right hand. Bring a person on your left hand. Bring two other people with you. Bring them on camp. So, we go as a multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, that's our word, with shouts of joy. It's a place of pleasure, the joy of God. The world offers foolish joys. How sad people sit before a box and watch stuff, have momentary laughs, and that's it. Leaves you more empty than ever before. Right? The devil's substitute for authentic, supernatural joy is all the pleasures that uh, the world has to offer, which leaves us more empty than at the beginning. I've told you this before, but more and more Christians buying larger screens. I hope you are not one of them who went on Boxing Day to buy a larger screen. Tragic. Right? We should be getting rid of stuff as we are maturing in our walk with God. Dr. Ajit Fernandi used to uh, say, you know, there was a time when after a very busy day of ministry, he would go home and he would switch on the TV and, you know, watch Tom and Jerry and have a laugh. Then he said, how foolish. Tom and Jerry helping me unwind. And he said, no, I'm now going to read a book. And he said he found immense release and peace just by reading a book. So now I have sought to follow in that. You need to have mentors who, who can speak into your life. Right? Don't follow the world. What they say is very foolish, very destructive, very unhealthy. Follow men of God, women of God, who can speak into your life. So, pleasure, joy. Number seven, and I'm going to now go through a little bit fast, praise. We come into the house of God to be able to corporately praise God. So what is praise? Very simple definition of praise to boast about God. We come to God's house to boast about our God. We all love to boast about different things, right? About the cricket team and about our family, about our dog, about the car that we bought, about whatever. But boasting about God is called praise. So that's why we highlight the character of God during our praise songs. Some aspects of God's character are, high, are highlighted. And again, Psalm 29 has this amazing verse. I have quoted it verbatim because for some of you, this is all going to be new. Look at it in your notes. And in his temple, all cry, boring Ask the average person, why don't you go to church? Boring. What does the Bible say? In his temple, everyone without exception cries out, glory. What a verse. 
That one verse should revolutionize your life. Psalm 29 and verse uh, 9. Number 8. Why do we come to church? Because in the church, in the house of God, there is proclamation of the word. Proclamation of the scriptures. The mind of God is revealed to us. This is where we hear the voice of God. Right? Yes, you hear it in your quiet time. But in an inexplicable way, you hear the mind of God, the voice of God for your life, for my life, as we come into the house of God. I always love standing at the door at the end of a service as people file past and for responses to the worship of the day. Some will start telling jokes about very sad when that happens. You go through a whole worship experience and the first thing out is a joke. But there are others who say, God spoke to me today. I was convicted. There are issues I need to deal with in my life. God used one point of your sermon, pastor, to minister to me. I hope increasingly that is going to be our response at the end of a sermon, at the end of a service, let me say. Because God can speak through a song. God can speak through a prayer. God can speak through another person ministering to you. Proclamation of the word. Right? Just like Nehemiah's time. The word read and the word explained and it brings about revival. Proclamation. Number nine. And again, I want to show it to you from the text. Psalm 63 and verse 2. Psalm 63 and verse 2. The experience of David. I have seen you in the sanctuary to see God in the house of God and beheld your power. In the house of God, we behold God's power. Now, what do you mean by that? Obviously, the building is not going to shake. Although in Isaiah's experience, the building did shake. And uh, no pun intended, there was holy smoke. Isaiah 6, it's in the text, right? But we don't have shaking of buildings or the rattling of pews. Sometimes I wish it did happen. But, uh, but the power of God is manifested. How? As you look at each other. So I look at a person and say, my goodness, one year ago I knew what this person's life was like. Today, look at the way God has worked in his life or her life. How the power of God has released her from sin. How she has heard the words, Daughter, go home in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Live a new life. And now they are hungering for God. They bring the Bible to church. They are reading it. They are bringing their friends to church. That's the power of God operating in the life of a person. So, you and I have to analyze our life this past year. What power was operating in my life? There is God's power or there could be demonic power. Satan is always fighting for rights in your life and my life. And the more we open up our life to the power of God, things are going to change. You know, the, the, the simplest prayer that you and I can ever pray is, Oh God, change me. Forget about the other person. God, change me. And when I begin to change... God is going to use me as a change agent in other people's lives. I've told this to many, many a husband or wife. Oh, my wife doesn't care about the Lord. My husband doesn't care about the Lord. I look at them and say, you be faithful. You demonstrate the power of God in your life. And without you having to ever speak a word, God is going to use the example of your life to draw people to himself. Starting with your family. You don't have to verbalize. You don't have to rationalize. You don't have to put Bible verses in your husband's lunchbox. Right? If you allow the power of God to work in your life. So, in the house of God, I see his power. Answers to prayer. Number 10, again, this, I, I wish I could have a whole sermon for this. Number 10. Perspective. 
I come to the house of God and I receive the divine perspective. Right through the week I got the human perspective. <laughs> what the world has got to say to me. So Psalm 73, the psalmist was really down in the dumps. God, why are the wicked prospering? God, why are the righteous suffering? God, I am going to church every Sunday. But God, look at what's happening in my life. God, that fellow next door doesn't care about you. He has got three cars down his driveway. Sunday mornings he is washing his cars, oh God. Why don't you send fire and burn up the three cars? <laughs> That's a very human way of praying. So you know what happened to the psalmist? So please turn to Psalm 73. If this verse is not marked in your Bible, take a moment now to mark it. Psalm 73. You can use it as a good counseling verse when people come to you with all kinds of challenges, right? So Psalm 73. Uh, let me read verse 16. When I try to understand all this, how the wicked are prospering and the righteous are being given a torrid time. When I try to understand this, when I try to mentally figure all this out, it was too oppressed for me. The word that we would use today is I got stressed out. Time to go see the doc and get some medicine. <laughs> That's not what the psalmist did. Verse 17, you are ready with your pen to mark it? Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood they are final destiny. This is the pivot on which the whole psalm turns. Psalm 73 verse 17. I decided to go to church. And, I, and when I went through the whole worship experience, my perspective changed. And instead of uh, feeling hate for these wicked people, my heart was filled with sorrow for the wicked people. Why? I realized where they were headed. They are headed towards a Christless eternity. They are headed to hell. Your whole perspective changes when you come to the house of God. That's why the devil doesn't want you to come to church. Have you got the ten points now? Church, have you got it? Good. Now, uh, the rest I'm going to just very rapidly fly by. So point B, the preparation. What preparations have I got to make to come to the house of God? Let me give you five. Number one, I'm stating the obvious, right? Okay, I'm stating the obvious. Rested well physically on the Saturday. Which means wherever you go, make sure you are back in your house by 9 p.m. Please write that down, 9 p.m. Okay, I know you're laughing because yesterday was a different story. That's an exception. There are exceptions. I, I understand that, right? But that should not become the rule. It must always be the exception. Church, will you repeat that after me? It should be the exception and not the rule. If every Saturday I am up till midnight watching the funny boys on the screen, I am not ready for the Lord's Day. Right? That's how A.W. Tozer described the clowns, the funny boys that you love to watch on the screen. So, rested well, physically on the Saturday. Get good sleep. I, I can't function on the Lord's Day if I, am, if I haven't had seven hours of solid sleep. I told our sister in the morning today, it takes me one hour to unwind wherever I go. My mind is hyperactive and I've got to slow it down. And uh, there are numerous ways that I try to slow it down. And then only beautiful sleep comes. And by 6 o'clock, boom, I'm up, right? Just, just awoken. And then I've got to go for my walk. I've got to be uh, exercised, right? Stretch and do everything so that I'm fit and ready on a Sunday morning to release the word of God into uh, the lives of people. Secondly, read and meditate on the word. I'm stating the obvious. Spend more time on a Saturday reading the word of God and praying. Preparing yourself spiritually to encounter God on the Lord's day. Number three, repent. Look back on the past week. Okay, any sin issues in your life? 
Any broken relationships that need to be dealt with, we need to put them right. Repent. Number four, rise early on the Lord's day. Why? Then there'll be no rush. Oh, pastor, you don't know my house. There's a fight for the washroom. Get up at five o'clock. <laughs> Very simple, right? You don't have to have, be a rocket scientist to figure all this out. We have gone for camps where 25 of us have to operate on one washroom. I, I took a youth group on a camp, not one of our groups, another church. And the leader there had meticulously put a timetable. 4 a.m., you three will get up and use the washroom. 4.20, the three of you will use the washroom. Because there was a practical problem. And we overcame it. But today, most houses have three uh, washrooms. Two of them have cobwebs, unused. Right? So, rise early on the Lord's day. So that there is no rush and you don't step on each other's toes and you start looking, oh, where is the iron? Where is my cloth? Did you see my shirt? All those problems are avoided if all the preparation is done on a Saturday. Right? So, come early. Please come early, 10 minutes early, so that you can prepare yourself. You can sit and pray, read a scripture portion, come early and sit. And then number five, resist the temptations that come from the devil. <laughs> Usually those temptations are intensified on Sunday morning around 9 a.m. Give yourself a break today. You've had a hard week. That's the voice of the devil. What do you do? Be gone, Satan. Or to put it bluntly, shut up. Never use those words on a husband or wife, but use it on the devil. Right? Shut up. Right? I am going to the house of God. Or you get that mysterious pain in the back at 9 a.m. Right? Just pray, Lord, cause this pain to disappear. Usually people who complain of that pain, it disappears at 12 noon. <laughs> Just attempts of the evil one to keep you away from enjoying the fullness of God's blessings on your life and on your family, folks. That's it. Now finally, I'm just like Nehemiah chapter 10, I'm going to call you to covenant. Now I'm not going to send a paper around, and, but this is between God and you, right? And uh, if I hold you accountable, I'm going to use this. Are you okay with this? Sister Rose, you're okay? Right. You're the spokesperson for the whole church? Right. I'm going to walk you through nine statements of covenant. And at the end of it, I'm going to ask you to put your signature, right? There's something about putting a signature that makes it final, right? In Canada, I always advise people, don't sign a form without knowing what you're signing. In my community, a lot of people just put the signature and later get into a lot of trouble. You signed! So I'm going to walk you through intelligently what you're going to put a signature to. And then you're going to put the date under the signature. Just in case you don't know, today is January the 10th, 2016. Okay, got to cover all the bases, right? You're ready for all that? Yes. Okay. Some of you are wondering, why did I come today? Okay. Now, number one. I will offer no excuses for absenteeism. No excuses whatsoever. So I want you to do a little reality check. Go back on 2015, and of the 52 Sundays, how many did you miss? And what was the excuse? Good exercise to engage in. Of the 52 Sundays of last year, how many did you miss? By the way, I keep an account of who and who comes on a Sunday. Yeah, I do, seriously. So I told a sister this morning, three Sundays, we didn't see all. And she was gracious enough and said, you're right, Pastor. But I am here today. Praise the Lord. So there is a black book, Christopher. And once it exceeds three, it goes into the red book. And then it's handed over to Brother Johnson to do the needful. Right? Because he is the chair of the board. Right. Now, secondly, second covenant. I will enter his presence with thanksgiving. 
That's taken from the Psalms. I will enter God's presence with thanksgiving. I'm not going to enter the house of God with negative mindset, with fault finding. Oh, today, pastor, did you notice so and so? The shirt was not ironed. Hey, that's not your problem. Got it? Right. Number three, I will come with expectation. <laughs> if you expect nothing to happen, that's what you get. You'll get according to your expectation. So come with expectation. So what is the expectation? The ten points that we looked at under point A. The ten purposes. Number four, I will encourage and edify others. When I come to the house of God, I'm not going to gossip. I'm going to encourage and I'm going to edify. So what is encourage? Encourage means to put courage into the heart of a person. That's the meaning of the word encourage. Edify means to build up, to build somebody up, right? Take them from this level to the next level. It could be through the quoting of a scripture. It could be through a little prayer that you pray for them, right? Number five, I will engage and excel in ministry. I don't want to be a spectator anymore. I don't want to be a pew warmer. I want to be engaged in ministry. I will engage and excel. Excel means I'm going to put my whole heart into it, my whole soul into it. I'm not going to be lethargic. Pastor, if I say yes, you can count on me. I don't have to be fretting and worrying. My goodness, is this going to get done? No, no. You can depend on me, Pastor. That, that's the meaning of Excel. Number six, I will be empowered by God's Spirit. I'm going to invoke the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit upon my life. Only then can I be a blessing to others, right? So a Spirit-filled Christian. Number seven, I will endeavor to maintain the unity of the church. So if I hear... You know, somebody talking, kuch, 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 kuch. I'm going to squash it. And uh, I'm not going to tolerate it. Right? I'm going to be committed to the unity of the church. I'm using words exactly taken from the text, Ephesians 4.3. Number nine, I will eagerly listen to God's word and act upon it. And I want to compliment you. From this vantage point, I can see all of you very engaged. Praise God for that, right? I can see you writing your notes. I can see you, uh, you know, thinking. And I want that trend to continue, okay? So you can pat yourself on the back for that. I will eagerly listen to God's word and act upon it. And number nine, I will exercise faith that the Lord will build this church. God, you are going to do something in 2016. God, you are going to touch lives. God, you are going to, and you can just fill the blanks. You are going to exercise faith. So those are nine covenants that we are going to make before the Lord. And you are going to put your signature and you are going to date it. Just between God and you. I'm not going to come and check. So, Wynn, do we have a final song? Right. So as uh, Wynn and the team come to lead us in a final song, uh, I would like to uh, close in a prayer. But Wynn, come on up. Lord, we thank you for the house of God, the church purchased at great cost. And even as we have explored it in great detail today, I pray that you will give each one of us grace to live according to what we have learned. Bless us with peace. Bless us with wholeness, well-being. For the glory of your name. Amen.